been a crazy week of football and we want to thank the fans who put their opinions forward against the European Super League. And we've got a special guest, right? Mr. Henry Winter, how are you doing, sir? You okay? I'm very good. I completely agree with you on the fans. It's been their week again. So how, how do we stop the likes of, like you said, the Glazers, John Hen W. Henry, Stan Kroenke, etc., and all the other owners that agreed to go into the S ESL? How do we stop this from rearing its head again, from coming back? Do you think Ed Woodward was privy to all of this? Um, I've heard lots of stories that he wasn't privy to it. We have to protect football at all levels, and that means standing up to these to these interlopers who've come into this game. So absolutely, there has to be some element of punishment. I, I love that, the, the concept of 50 plus one. They don't understand that PR and marketing is a huge part, and perception even. Yeah, 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 yeah. You already know the vibes. Welcome back to another episode of Vibe with Five. It's been a crazy week of football and we want to thank the fans who put their opinions forward against the European Super League. Now, we have a chat with Chris Wilder that's coming out later on this week, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And also at the same time, we've got a special guest, right? Mr. Henry Winter, how are you doing, sir? You okay? I'm very good. I completely agree with you on the fans. It's been their week again. It really has. I mean, myself, Rio, Steve, who I should have named beforehand, had a lot to say this week. A couple of videos that we dropped. Uh, Rio, you want to take the floor and uh, talk to Henry real quick? No, I just want to say thanks for coming on, Henry. Obviously, if anyone doesn't know, Henry's been um, somebody who's been writing in and around football, sport, for many, many years throughout my career and before that. Um, and is one of probably the most... Um, influential writers I'd say out there and most respected from the players especially so um it's a great it's a great pleasure to have you on and just get a perspective from normal media as to how normal media has consumed this last week's um news and and how you guys feel about it I think everyone's quite clear and understands um from from vibe with five five how we think about things what's your take on the whole situation I think that's why we want to get you on we want to get someone who's respected and trusted in the game as well do you know what, Rio? Everyone's been saying that it's been a bad week for football. I think it's been an amazing week for football. I've been going to games and you know, Leeds United, Ellen Road last week when uh, when Liverpool turned up and the Leeds United fans were supporting the Liverpool supporters there who were complaining about what, what John W. Henry was doing to, to the club. Then you saw, obviously, the scenes outside Stamford Bridge, the Chelsea fans there. It wasn't simply Chelsea fans there. It was supporters from around the power of social media, networks like yours, people reacting, coming over and saying we don't want this we have to confront the enemy within which is particularly the american owners and then it just carried on i was at arsenal on friday as well and you know there were probably about two thousand fans out there i mean it, it was a mainly good humored demonstration a protest against stan Kroenke. And then you saw a little bit at the weekend, particularly at uh, there was some at uh, with, with the Leeds Manchester United, two of your old clubs, Rio. And mm -hmm. then again at uh, I mean I was at, at Wembley. There was a little bit of we want Levy out and you know greed, you know fans ahead of greed. And uh, so I think it's been a fantastic week in terms of I mean we are, I cannot remember an issue which is so united the whole country, the whole family of football. I mean, just everyone, whether it's the president of the Football Association, the future king of the country, Prince William, to fans, to media, social media, Gary Neville, your old teammate, I thought was fantastic on Sky. You've been brilliant on it. The fans have been, just been fantastic on it. And just saying enough is enough. But Rio, you know, you know the situation. The Glazers will be back. John W. Henry will be back. Stan Kroenke will be back because it's about money. It's about greed. And those issues for them, in them, and what they perceive on the back of the pandemic, those haven't gone away. So I think the fans particularly have won this battle, but we haven't yet won the war. So how, how do we stop the likes of, like you said, the Glazers, John Hent, W. Henry, Stan Kroenke, et cetera, and all the other owners that agreed to go into the S ESL? How do we stop this from rearing its head again, from coming back First, we have to tighten the laws because the, the Premier League uh, rule nine is, is is not quite strong enough to, to, to punish them properly. I think we've also got to sort of educate them and sit down. 
I mean, the Premier League, the officials there have to sit down with these owners and explain to them, actually, in the long term, we know you're all about money. You didn't grow up with with pictures of sort of United or Liverpool or Chelsea or whoever, which, whichever legends on your wall. You, you know, you're in this for the money. So you can make money, but by doing it all together, by being with the fans, by not ripping off the fans, by developing young players, by developing your club, building, doing well in Europe, doing well. You don't, it doesn't have to be so just you don't have to have a breakaway to make money from it. So you have to speak the language that they understand. You have to have some punitive element. People are talking about points deduction. I mean, I've spoken to enough people at uh, Premier League clubs know that that I really cannot see that happening. I'm sure a lot of people out there want to punish these uh, these breakaway clubs because what they do and they still intend doing this is ripping apart the pyramid of this uh, of football in this country what they're also doing is undermining their own squads ultimately long term because how many players actually came up through grassroots club Rio you started out with a sort of a local team in Peckham before sort of you know yeah. rising up through the ranks at, at, at West Ham we have to protect football at all levels and that means standing up to these to these interlopers who've come into this game. So absolutely, there has to be some element of punishment, but we've also, we've got to sit them down, make them see sense, make them realize that we know that, that they're in this game for the money, but actually, if they're sensible, if they work with the supporters and they actually respect the traditions of this country, they can do well long-term and their investments will rise. But they have to understand that when you invest in a football club, it's not just a financial investment, it's an emotional investment as well. And they've got to respect that and got to respect the traditions of this country and the fan base more. I think that's the the, the big mistake that they made. They didn't realise that, that these football clubs have an emotional element to them. I think in American sports, it's very less so. And I think when you look at this idea that they had and they, they've hatched together, this idea could have only have come up from somebody who's not somebody who's American. If you're looking at the owners, it must have come from people that are American because their game, this is what their games are about. The NFL, the NBA, NHL, there's no relegation. There's no competitive. The competitive energy comes out of their sports at certain times. And there's no, there's not as much emotion. The, the I fans disagree there, with you, you know, Rio. I don't you disagree. Think yeah, because I think besides the relegation and the promotional part, I think you're right on that 100%. Mm. But the, the pressure that some of these parents will put on some of these guys to become athletes, we can't talk about pressure and, and the passion that they have for their sport. I think what they tried to do was just replicate their model and slam it into the UK uh, yeah, UK version. And that's not going to work because we no, have... No, but you, you, you maybe misread my, what I'm saying, though. I understand... The, I'm not questioning the passion for their sport. Mm -hmm. This is about the passion for your club and your individual clubs and the emotion for a club. So to say, oh, I want to become a footballer is quite a wide, it's a wide fault. But I, I actually support Man United and I follow them everywhere and I buy their shirts religiously and I'll go the length and breadth of this world to go and watch them play week in, week out. I'll and go all over England. With Red Sox, baseball. But when you see, where do you see the Red Sox uh -huh. support? Where do you see the Red Sox supporters going away? What they don't play away religiously. No, what I'm saying to you, dude, this is the diff they don't go away. They don't, they don't, they don't sit there and go, oh, actually, our team. There's a fear factor. There's, a, there's a, an, an unbelievable energy in staying up in this league, let alone winning it. Just staying in this league. This is all creates all of the pantomime, the theatre within these football clubs from history from over a hundred years, and they're trying to rip that apart and and play. A sterile sport it becomes sterile you how many in the teams when you look at the nba yeah. before you get to halfway through the season yeah. there's dead rubber matches because teams are out of it the premier league's not like that i hear you I'm not, not like that. I'm not questioning um what you're saying in regards to relegation and what they're saying but i reckon we have to be very clear here i think it's their model the model that they're used to he's tried to replicate it but it's just not going to run because it's not part of our culture so uh, and I, I think the two of you are actually agreeing with each other. What, 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 what Rio is saying is that this concept, the American approach, simply doesn't work over here. And I, I, lo I love the tradition over here. The, the Americans wouldn't understand the FA Cup. The idea of, uh, of a Hereford United beating a Newcastle United. I mean, Rio, you've been involved in enough FA Cup ties. 
that slight concern as you're going out there, I imagine, Ria, that the fact that you're facing an underdog and there are 30, 40,000 people out there, as well as millions watching on television, that is the joy of football, particularly in this country. That sporting jeopardy, the fact that there is, you can have a Sheffield United climbing up through. The Americans, when you talk to the Americans, they simply cannot understand the concept of Leicester City winning the title in 2016, having sort of fought their way up through the divisions. It's just anathema to them because they want it sealed off because they don't want it for financial reasons, the possibility of, of sliding down, you know, this game of snakes and ladders, which people have been alluding to. So absolutely. So look, we can talk about the NBA and they're fantastic sport, but you cannot compare the two. Just as we wouldn't impose the pyramid system onto uh, Major League Baseball. I don't think it's purely an American thing, though. I think there's some people probably seen their ass a little bit with that. You've got to remember Florentino Perez is the president yeah. of this thing. It's not a pure in, in England, yeah, you're looking at a couple of American owners, but Abramovich ain't American, Sheikh Mansour ain't American, Levy, Levy ain't American. I but think Jake that Morgan, all Morgan. American is all yeah, right, the model might be, but the, the owners and the people that are involved in it you know, are only partially American. But look who are the driving forces. Obviously, the, the Spanish clubs have got involved because of their huge, huge, huge debts at the moment, because they haven't been well-run clubs. But actually, the driving forces have been the three American families who have been pushing 100%. it. The driving forces have been JP Morgan, who, you know, they're a pretty successful investment bank. Well, they sort of seven times winner of investment bank of the year. You know, what a trophy. Um, but what they don't actually understand what it's all about and i mean if, they, if they'd had 30 seconds talking to you three in a quiet room last friday they wouldn't have gone ahead with this if they talked to any fan in this country they wouldn't have gone ahead with this and one thing i've learned in life is that incredibly intelligent well-paid people who are high up in business can be spectacularly thick and ill-advised and ill-informed and fail when they step into football mm. and it's terrifying how the likes of daniel levy who've been involved in football for so long were I saw a quote saying he was shocked at the backlash. Like, <laughs> I think there's a reason why all these clubs kept it as secret as they did. And I think they, the smart ones probably should have known. I'm surprised Ed Woodward didn't understand. He's had enough backlash of late. I'm surprised he wasn't aware of that this was going to be a, a horrendous that's a, that's a good point. Can I just kind of, do you think Ed Woodward was privy to all of this? Um, I've heard lots of stories that he wasn't privy to it the fact that edward wood used to work for jp morgan he helped introduce the sort of the the, the glazers to you know and sort of did the uh, help do the deal there i mean he is a very savvy individual because of his work on the european clubs association before he resigned because of he, you know he was embedded deep within the, the premier league corridors of power edward wood I don't think he's a bad man, but I just think he's a money man. And I just think he completely misread it. But I think he must have known about it. If he, I'd be amazed if he didn't know about it, given his contact contacts within football. Hmm. So where do you reckon now the clubs will go from here? Because Henry, when you first came on, you're like, you said they'll be back. The Glazers will be back. And that's a bit worrying, isn't it? I mean, there's all these marches, etc. How will they be back? When? But 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 that, with respect to the marches and the protests, and I've been to them, and they are they are fantastic. But they're not in Denver. They're not in Miami. They're not in Boston. They don't actually impinge upon the lives of these three, particularly the three families. Josh Conkier went on the Arsenal Supporters Trust uh, Zoom, and he got an absolute verbal kicking from the uh, from actually a fairly measured fan base on the Arsenal Supporters Trust. You know, they don't really get too uptight about anything, but they gave him an absolute going over, and quite rightly. But have have Manchester United fans heard anything from Joel Glazer? Was it one interview in in no comment? Stan Kroenke, I mean, his nickname is Silent Stan. The contempt that these individuals have for the supporters. If they were, so Kroenke has got uh, connections with Walmart. He, I cannot believe the board of Walmart in the United States would treat customers, shoppers, whoever goes into Walmart with the contempt with which Kroenke deal, um, looks at uh, Arsenal fans. Just one final thing. And that is why the government, for all their sins, and they're not mm. necessarily football people, particularly the Prime Minister, at least it looks like an Oliver Dowden at DCMS, at least it looks, and Tracy Crouch, the former sports minister, Spurs fan, very good moral compass, at least those two look like they're going to bring in maybe a push to have uh, supporter representation on boards, which is absolutely vital. Because any fan on any of those boards, of those 12 
uh, clubs, the so-called founding fathers, the Dirty Dozen, as, as they've been nicknamed, any fan on those boards would have immediately raised a red flag and said, this is disgraceful. We should not be doing this and await the backlash. Completely, I completely agree. And, and just to the point, these guys have got so much money, so much influence, their experience in the fields that they've worked in all their lives, and they take over football club. They don't understand that PR and marketing is a huge part, and perception even, is a huge part of what they have to actually invest in too. And I think that's one of the tricks that they missed in this situation. Yes, they should have got a little bit of a to, to check the temperature from some fans, but as important, they should have had a, a, a PR group, a marketing group that would have sat there. How could you? I don't know. That, that, that I don't to know. Me is, you guys are billionaires. You guys, I just don't get it. I just arrogance. don't get it. It's arrogance. Arrogance, yeah. Arrogance, arrogance is a good word. Avarice or a dangerous combination. Look, they paid a lot of money for PR people. And look, if you pay money to PR people, they tend to, to take the money. And whether that was actually raised, I mean, I know one of the, the, the PR individuals involved, and he's, he's very highly talented. And I'm amazed that he wouldn't have raised it with him. I'm amazed the lawyers wouldn't have said something. I'm amazed the bankers would have said something. But maybe why should I be surprised? Because it's good business for them that this might actually go ahead, even if only for 48 hours. Personally, I think it's damaging for JP Morgan's reputation. I think it's damaging for the reputation of the uh, the PR companies that were involved. And it's particularly damaging for the, the reputations of the, the individuals involved. And the fact that Florentino Perez is still saying, well, you know, this can go ahead. I mean, as Seferin made a point in the, I think, the Mail on Sunday at the weekend with his interview with Rob Draper, he said sort of Florentino Perez is like the sort of, you know, the knight from the Monty Python film. He keeps on having limbs chopped off and he says, you know, bring it on. You know, it's only a flesh wound. Mm -hmm. And they are they are dead. This, But they are dead for this time. Make no, have no doubts about this. They will be back. The Glazers won't change their tune and their tune is the sound of money. Henry, we've got a few things sort of spinning around here that I want to try and grab down and get your thoughts on. We've got fan ownership seems to be the big push that sort of fell out of this week. We've got 50 plus one, which was really the sort of motto that we heard at Old Trafford this weekend. You mentioned for a second there fans on boards, but I wouldn't mind going a bit deeper into that. Uh, and punishment for the clubs, this talk of removing some of the CEOs and executives involved in this as punishment. Uh, should we start there on that and then digest the rest? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, you're talking about what can actually be achieved by football. So I don't think points deduction is going to happen. I don't think there is an appetite for that. I think, that unfortunately, the lawyers would be all over that. And the, do we want the whole league program frozen for a year? Well, you know, the uh, I mean, the title should be decided at Old Trafford, not the Old Bailey, for a start. Okay, but your last point, which is which is very relevant and has already started happening, is that there has been a purging of some of the the sort of the Ed Woodward, Bruce Buck. Uh, type individuals from Chelsea who were involved in uh, Premier League committees. I was talking to one uh, chief executive who's been involved in these committees for a long time, and he said the arrogance of the six. He said, it's great, no more, of, if I'm allowed to swear, he said, they're brilliant, no more of that big six bollocks, because they've been seen yeah. off, because they would arrive at meetings late, whether on Zoom or in the past in person, they'd be standing outside the room in their little, you know, bunch of conspirators, then they would go in and they would try to whack the other 14 around. Now, the other 14, of course, know that those six are, how, because of their global appeal, is one of the reasons why the television money is so good. So again, there, there is a balance there. But absolutely, your last point, Steve, is completely right, is actually getting rid of some of these individuals from those clubs, from the positions of power. That's happened at the ECA, the European Clubs Association. That's happened at UEFA already. And it's happening within the Premier League. But also, you've got to have representation. You've got to work with these clubs. It's all very well to say, let's sort of banish them. You can't banish Manchester United and Liverpool and clubs like that. The Premier League is better together. It's stronger together with these great, famous clubs involved. As long as they see sense and they don't try to be the enemy within and, and break it up. But what the last point on that I'll say is, there are good people working at these clubs. And it was a point that Klopp made this week, and I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been making as well, is that criticise the owners, don't necessarily criticise the clubs. I mean, we, you know Manchester United well. You know how many good people work there on the community side, on the coaching side, in the academy side, at the training ground, at, at the stadium. The fact that Manchester United have kept all their kitchens open during the pandemic to feed local school children 
complementing the amazing work that Marcus Rashford's been doing. I think there's so much good at these clubs. So we have to remember this fight is against the owners, not necessarily these six clubs. So they're good people at these clubs. Let's get one or two of them onto the Premier League committee, onto the ECA and onto UEFA. Henry, aren't those six um, oh, also oh. talking about the reenactment of Project Big Picture? Well, we've got to hit that on the head. I mean, that didn't last particularly long either because there was a backlash against that. I think what is interesting for the first time, and I mean, we are very kindly sort of talked about how long I've been doing this. I've been doing this for 35 years as a, as a journalist and I've seen governments get involved before and I've seen they don't really want to do it and they tend to get involved just on the eve of an election because it's, it's you know, it's good <laughs> for PR and it's good for, for voting. But I actually think there is an appetite for them to bring in, coming back to your point uh, about uh, fan representation on boards. Now, there's a balance there about how how you actually do that, because there's so much confidential information. If you're going to be giving a new contract to say Paul Pogba, can a supporters representative be there? I actually think at some point we should trust the fans. It was the fans that saw off the owners last week. And it's, we have to trust the fans to have one or two of them on, on boards who actually listen, give advice, and also almost like the sort of the moral guardian in the corner saying, no, Mr. Glazer, don't be a prat, don't do that, there'll be a backlash, your share price will go down, which is kind of the only language that the Glazers understand. So absolutely, and I think government is very keen on that, to actually have some fan representation on the board. You mentioned 50 plus one. Do you know what? Again, bring it back into the real world. How do you actually say to a private business, you've got to give a percentage of your um, your shares away? I can't go. If I shop at Sainsbury's, I can't go and say I want to see it on the Sainsbury's board. Well, on that, Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund are private companies that hold the, the rights to the club and all the sponsorships and stuff like that. And their first 11 is dealt with as something entirely different. And the members club associated with the, the public limited company has the voting rights over it. So you can still buy and sell shares in that company, but the members vote with the 50 plus one still has the controlling say, or probably more of a veto on crazy ideas like, like the European Super League rather than the day-to-day -day workings. I mean, I'm trying to get hold of someone that's a, a German football expert to find out more on this. But from my understanding is... There's a couple of German clubs that are entirely member-owned, entirely member-run, and that's the likes of um, Union Berlin and Nuremberg. But Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich, they are privately held public limited companies that have the members' votes attached to them. So there's, there's actually two ways, or three, if you count Leipzig's way of doing it, there's actually two major ways of, of actually running the 50 plus one. So even with the fan ownership, I think ownership's a, a funky word that might be a bit rough, especially when you're talking about $4 billion companies. But when it comes to the the fan membership and, and the members having a, a vote and a veto on the crazy ideas, I think that's absolutely something that should come in, as well as my fan being on the board. Or, or maybe that would like, be, you know, I don't know if that actually makes one redundant. I'm not sure. No, no, I think I, well, I completely see that. And I, I you know, I, I was at school in the, in Germany as a kid and I used to go and watch the sort of Bayern Munich. And I, I love that, the, the concept of 50 plus one. I think you can do that if you're starting out, if we were rebuilding the sort of the Premier League and said, right, OK, sort of 20 new owners are going to come in, but you've still got to have 50 plus one. It's very difficult. And it'd be, I, I don't know whether actually a Tory party would ever consider doing something the socialist is giving away parts of a football club, even if they thought it was such a huge uh, vote spinner. You're getting into quite sort of political, financial, legal areas there with 50 plus one. I think it will be good, but I just think it's impractical in terms of the, the possibility of bringing that in when these clubs are so embedded with their shareholders. I'm trying to be realistic here. I think the realistic element is actually having support to trust members on the board with an element of power, with a vote. So I, I think the only way to it's going to happen is is that if you get a fans or two or three whoever it is on that board to get a, 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 as part of a controlling vote that they get a say in sway in what happens with big decisions because like you said for a businessman to come and invest a billion pounds two billion three hundred million whatever it is into a company and say yeah but I'm going to give away certain shares and complete voting rights that ain't happening no no business, same businessman is going to do that. 
what one thing I can see happening now, which will be for the immediate good of football or good of football, because it, it's when the Champions League new contract kicks in in 2024. I think this ridiculous idea of having two historic wild cards as a safety net for a couple of clubs who haven't qualified, famous clubs who haven't qualified through their own league for the Champions League. I think that should be scrapped. We should give it to. You know, to, to another Scottish country, to, to the to, to, sorry, to the Scots, to, to the Dutch, maybe to East Europe. I, absolutely, everything has to come back to merit. And when it, you, Rio, your old club, I was there at uh, El Rome. In fact, Rio, it seems like only yesterday. I remember you standing on the pitch with that long, that long white coat. It was oh. funny. Very, yeah, very impressive. Still got it. I still don't got it. The hair. Don't forget the hair as well. Don't forget the hair. I still got it. Um, you, you look great. The um, the fans there, they made the point outside that enough is enough and the players the Leeds players and the club made the point inside the ground with that early yeah. on the pitch and that's what you've got to do that's what mm. sport's about that's why Rio got to the top and played so often won title Champions League and played so often for England it was about hard work and merit not about a sinecure not about walking to the front of a sort of VIP queue and just having the rope lifted for you so you get it I'm sorry Rhea, you probably had that happen I like that I don't mind that element I've got to be honest <laughs> on a cold night on a cold night <laughs> Yeah, but you've but you know you've worked for that right. You your career was based on merit, and sporting success and prominence should be based on merit. Henry, so who's right then? Because it's like what you, we're picking less of the evil, right? Because you've got the ESL. Nobody wants anything to do with it. But then you're going you're going with this weird system. I personally think that UEFA are getting away with a lot here because when I look at their history. And um, obviously the set bladder situations and stuff like that. I'm just, I'm just not a fan of it at all. So, Joe, Joe, just to sort of clarify, well, I think yeah. we the power that the sort of non-dirty dozen clubs have regained in the ECA and UEFA, they mm. should now say to, uh, to, because of those changes that came in last Monday, they should say no. We don't want that. Let's scrap those two extra wild card places. Let's actually have a more of a meritocracy because actually what people are calling it ESL light was effectively brought in last Monday by UEFA. So the fact now that the good guys in inverted commas uh, are back in the position of power, uh, let's get let's get rid of that. And let's actually just keep the Champions League about merit rather than about sort of how well you've done with coefficients over the previous five years. And on that note, I think it's a great way to finish because I totally agree with that. So, um, listen, Henry, man, really appreciate having you on. Love hearing you speak about issues like this that surround football. And when it gets a bit political, no one kind of unpicks it the way you do with such clarity. So I really appreciate your time. And we'll catch up soon, I'm sure. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. And don't forget, you know, programmes like yours, podcasts like yours have been absolutely vital in leading the, leading the fight against the owners along with the fans. So fair play to you. Top man. Thanks a lot, Henry, man. Take Good care. Hey, guys. Cheers.